Sam Storm's analysis of spiritual gifts in Romans 12, 3, 8 emphasizes their importance and contextual understanding within Paul's broader writings. He begins by contrasting the gifts listed in Romans with those in 1 Corinthians 12, referencing Gordon Fee's viewpoint. Fee argues that the charismata in Romans may not be exclusively spiritual gifts, but also include extensive ethical behaviors, accentuating the grace of God in practical expressions rather than specific spirit manifestations. Storms counters Fee's interpretation, asserting that Paul's consistent use of charismata suggests these are indeed spiritual gifts. He highlights that gifts like prophecy and teaching, present in both Romans and 1 Corinthians, support the notion that all listed gifts in Romans are spiritual manifestations meant to strengthen the church. Storms contends that these gifts are the fruit of God's grace, intended to benefit the community through the Spirit's empowerment. Exploring individual gifts, Storms first addresses prophecy, which should be exercised in proportion to our faith. This means prophets must speak confidently only what they believe to be divinely revealed. He contradicts this with interpretations that faith refers to the content of Christian belief. The gift of service encompasses various forms of ministry, possibly including financial aid, and is not limited to deacons. Teaching, crucial for explaining biblical traditions and defending against errors, is essential for elders, but not exclusive to them and women can also possess this gift. Exhortation, linked with teaching, indicates encouraging others to live out biblical truths. The gift of giving should be characterized by generosity or simplicity, ensuring pure motives without seeking personal gain. Leadership involves diligent oversight and is applicable beyond just elders and pastors. The gift of mercy, likely aimed at aiding the sick, discouraged, or economically struggling, should be exercised with cheerfulness, reflecting a joyful disposition rather than bare obligation. In summary, Storms maintains the significance of these gifts as manifestations of God's grace, intended to build and support the Christian community through faithful and joyful service. Also, in Ephesians 4.11, 16, Paul points out the significance of various roles within the Christian community – apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. These roles are given by God to equip the saints for ministry, promoting unity and maturity in the body of Christ. Beyond individual abilities, God bestows people who are gifted to edify and strengthen others. The mention of evangelists in this context, also found in Acts 21, 8 and 2, Timothy 4, 5, raises the question of whether they were itinerant or stationary. Both roles are possible, as they were instrumental in gospel proclamation and conversions. The grammatical structure in the text suggests that shepherds and teachers might be a combined role, pastor-teachers, though there is debate about whether a pastor can exist without being a teacher. This is the only instance in the New Testament where shepherd is used as a noun, with its verb form appearing in Acts 20.28 20, and 1 Peter 5, 1, 4, indicating elders' duty to shepherd God's people. This implies that while all pastors teach, not all teachers are pastors. Similarly, all elders shepherd, but not all shepherds are elders. Paul's list of roles is not necessarily a strict blueprint for church government. These roles represent the various spiritual gifts within the church, akin to other lists in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. The primary function of these gifts, as outlined in Ephesians 4.12, is to equip the saints, enable ministry, and build up the church. Interpretations of these prepositional phrases vary. One view suggests all believers are equipped for ministry by these gifted individuals, while another holds that these individuals themselves perform the ministry and edification roles. Spiritual gifts are central for reducing spiritual immaturity. Paul diverges childish immaturity, marked by instability and susceptibility to false teachings, with mature unity of faith. Proper exercise of spiritual gifts fosters theological discernment and stability counteracting the doctrinal vacillation that afflicts many believers. Thus, these gifts are vital for the Church's growth and resilience against deceitful schemes. In conclusion, Storm's inquiry of spiritual gifts in Romans 12, 3, 8 reiterates their gravity within Paul's comprehensive theological framework. He varies the gifts listed in Romans with those in 1 Corinthians 12, referencing Gordon Fee's perspective. Fee suggests that the charismata in Romans may include expansive ethical behaviors 
rather than strictly spiritual gifts. However, Storms debates that Paul's consistent use of charismata indicates these are indeed spiritual gifts. He repeats that gifts like prophecy and teaching, present in both Romans and 1 Corinthians, support the view that all listed gifts in Romans are spiritual manifestations meant to strengthen the church. These gifts, Storms underlines, are the fruit of God's grace, designed to benefit the community through the Spirit's enablement. Storms delves into specific gifts, starting with prophecy, which should be exercised in proportion to our faith. This indicates that prophets must certainly speak only what they believe is divinely shown. The gift of service includes various forms of ministry, possibly financial aid, and is not restricted to deacons. Teaching is compelling for explaining biblical traditions and defending against errors, important for elders but not exclusive to them, and women can also possess this gift. Exhortation, linked with teaching, underscores stimulating others to live out biblical truths. The gift of giving should be demonstrated by generosity or candor, ensuring pure motives without seeking personal gain. Leadership involves diligent oversight and extends outside limits of just elders and pastors. The gift of mercy, likely aimed at aiding the sick, disheartened or economically struggling, should be exercised with cheerfulness, echoing a joyful inclination rather than minor obligation. Moreover, in Ephesians 4.11.16, Paul emphasizes various roles within the Christian community – apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. These roles are given by God to equip the saints for ministry, promoting unity and maturity in the body of Christ. Storms notes that these roles are not a strict plan for church government, but represent various spiritual gifts within the church. The primary function of these gifts is to equip the saints, enable ministry, and build up the church. Proper exercise of spiritual gifts promotes theological ascertainment and stability, offsetting doctrinal vacillation and enhancing the church's development and resilience against deceitful schemes. On the other hand, Storm's investigation of spiritual gifts, particularly in Romans 12, 3, 8, presents an inclusive perspective on their consequence and contextual understanding within Paul's far-reaching writings. Storms challenges Gordon Fee's interpretation that the charismata in Romans are not exclusively spiritual gifts, but include sweeping ethical behaviours. According to Fee, these behaviours accentuate the grace of God in practical expressions rather than specific spirit manifestations. Storms opposes this by affirming that Paul's consistent use of charismata across his epistles suggests these are indeed spiritual gifts. He disputes that gifts like prophecy and teaching which appear in both Romans and 1 Corinthians, support the idea that all gifts listed in Romans are spiritual manifestations meant to strengthen the church. Storms posits that these gifts are the fruit of God's grace, intended to benefit the community through the Spirit's empowerment. In comparison, Reformed cessationism holds that the miraculous gifts ceased with the apostolic age. This perspective is grounded in the belief that these gifts aided a specific purpose in the early church for the authentication of the Apostles' message and the establishment of the Church. With the completion of the New Testament canon, Reformed cessationists argue that the need for such gifts diminished as the Bible itself became the full and sufficient revelation of God's will. This angle asserts the sufficiency of Scripture, maintaining that all essential guidance and edification for the Church can be found within its pages. The historical and theological foundation of cessationism within Reformed theology highlights a commitment to the primacy of Scripture and a cautious approach to claims of ongoing revelatory gifts. As such, cessationists prioritize the exposition of the Bible and the continuation of non-miraculous gifts, which they believe are sufficient for the edification and guidance of the Church today. This access brings a foundation for determining spiritual gifts that is rooted in a high view of Scripture's authority and fullness. First of all, Storm's perspective on the nature of charismata in Romans and 1 Corinthians is pivotal to figuring out his stance on spiritual gifts. He contrasts the lists of gifts provided in Romans 12, 3, 8 and 1 Corinthians 12, indicating their complementary nature rather than their difference. According to Storm's, Paul's use of the term charismata in both letters suggests a coherent grasp of these gifts as spiritual manifestations planned to build up the church. He firmly resists Gordon Fee's interpretation 
that the charismata in Romans could include wide ethical behaviours rather than specific spiritual gifts. Fee's perspective maintains the grace of God manifested in practical, everyday actions rather than through extraordinary spiritual gifts. However, Storms insists that Paul's consistent terminology and inclusion of specific gifts such as prophecy and teaching indicate that all listed gifts in Romans are indeed spiritual in nature. Storm's assertion centers on the idea that these gifts are given by God's grace to enable the church community. He points out that gifts like prophecy and teaching, which appear in both Romans and 1 Corinthians, contribute strong evidence that Paul viewed all charismata as essential for the church's spiritual health and progress. According to Storms, these gifts are not merely ethical behaviours, but are direct manifestations of the Holy Spirit's work within the believer. They help the specific intention of edifying the church, boosting faith, and supporting unity among believers. This perspective reiterates the weight Storms places on the continuity and functionality of these gifts within the life of the church. In disagreement, Reformed cessationism presents a different interpretation of these passages, repeating that the miraculous gifts mentioned in the New Testament supplied a unique role in the early church. Cessationists contend that these gifts were instrumental in authenticating the Apostles' message and enacting the base of the Christian faith. Once the New Testament canon was accomplished, the need for such extraordinary gifts diminished as the scriptures themselves equipped the full and sufficient revelation of God's will. This view supposes that the meaning of miraculous gifts was to validate the early Christian message during a time when the New Testament was not yet fully written and widely accessible. With the achievement of the canon, cessationists believe that the role of such gifts became redundant, as the authority of the written word took precedence. Cessationists maintain that while miraculous gifts like prophecy and tongues have ceased, other non-miraculous gifts continue to play a basic role in the church. These include gifts such as teaching, exhortation, leadership, and acts of mercy, which are seen as crucial for the ongoing edification and governance of the church community. This distinction is deciding to the cessationist case as it acknowledges the continued presence of spiritual gifts while delineating between those that were temporary and those that are enduring. The prominence is placed on the sufficiency and completeness of Scripture for all matters of faith and practice, debating that the Bible furnishes all the basic guidance for the Church without the need for new revelatory gifts. From a cessationist standpoint, the gifts listed in Romans 12, 3, 8 are grasped within the wide-ranging context of the finished canon. Prophecy, for example, is viewed as a fundamental gift that was crucial for the early Church but has since ceased with the closing of the canon. Cessationists dispute that the role of prophecy has been fulfilled by the inscripturated Word of God, which now delivers as the ultimate authority. Similarly, the gift of tongues is seen as a sign for unbelievers that authenticated the Apostles' message, but is no longer needed in the post-apostolic age. Moreover, cessationists underline that the miraculous gifts were often associated with the Apostles themselves, who were uniquely commissioned by Christ to lay the bedrock of the Church. Ephesians 2.20 describes the church as being built on the groundwork of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. This central role means that once the infrastructure was laid, the extraordinary means used to form it were no longer decisive. As such, the cessationist perspective underscores the unique historical context of the early church and the specific role that miraculous gifts played during that period. In light of this, cessationists view the gifts mentioned in Romans 12. 3. 8. Through the lens of the achieved canon and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. They argue that while the miraculous gifts gave a decisive aim in the early church, their cessation does not entail a cessation of the Spirit's work. Rather, the Holy Spirit continues to empower believers through the ordinary means of grace, such as the preaching and teaching of the Word, prayer, and the sacraments. These means are sufficient for the edification and advance of the church, ensuring that believers are equipped for every good work. Basically, while Storms emphasizes the continuity and concern of spiritual gifts, as described in Romans and 1 Corinthians, Reformed cessationism offers a nuanced perspective that distinguishes between the temporary miraculous gifts of the apostolic age and the lasting gifts that continue to edify the church today.
This cessationist view upholds the sufficiency of Scripture and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit through the ordinary means of grace, giving a core for interpreting spiritual gifts within the context of the finalized canon. Furthermore, in Romans 12, 3, 8, Paul lists specific spiritual gifts, each playing a fundamental role in the life and ministry of the Church. Storm's interpretation of these gifts accentuates their spiritual nature and the consequence of exercising them in faith and humility. However, from a Reformed cessationist perspective, a different knowledge emerges, specifically regarding the cessation of certain miraculous gifts. The first gift Paul mentions is prophecy. Storms interprets prophecy as the ability to speak forth revelations from God, exercised in proportion to our faith. He contends that prophets must surely declare only what they believe to be divinely disclosed. This interpretation suggests an ongoing role for prophecy in the Church. However, cessationists debate that prophecy, as known in the New Testament, was a constitutional gift that ceased with the conclusion of the canon. They believe that the role of prophecy has been accomplished by the inscripturated Word of God, which now presents as the ultimate authority and source of divine revelation. In this view, the need for new revelatory messages is obsolete, as the Bible supplies a total and sufficient guide for faith and practice. The gift of service or ministry is the next on Paul's list. Storms sees this gift enveloping a wide range of practical ministries, including acts of service that may not be limited to deacons, but can be exercised by any believer. From a cessationist belief, while the gift of service continues to be critical in the Church, it is distinct from the miraculous gifts that cessationists believe have ceased. Service is viewed as a moral responsibility and an expression of Christian love, which remains imperative for the edification of the Church community. Teaching is another critical gift mentioned by Paul. Storms affirms its emphasis in explaining biblical truths and defending against doctrinal errors. He asserts that teaching is not exclusive to elders, but can be exercised by anyone gifted in this area, including women. Cessationists concur on the influence of teaching, but highlight its foundation in the completed scripture. They believe that the gift of teaching involves the accurate account and application of the Bible, ensuring that believers are grounded in sound doctrine. The role of teachers in the church today is imperative for the spiritual advancement and maturity of the congregation, relying on the authority of the Word of God. Exhortation, closely linked with teaching, is indicated by storms as the gift of emboldening others to live out biblical truths. He stresses that exhortation involves urging fellow believers to apply Scripture in their daily lives. Cessationists agree on the need of exhortation viewing it as a means to advance spiritual growth and obedience to God's commands. This gift remains relevant and fundamental in the Church, providing believers with the encouragement and motivation to pursue holiness and faithful living. In addition, Storms focuses on the gift of giving, maintaining that it should be typified by generosity and clarity, ensuring that motives are pure and not self-seeking. From a cessationist perspective, giving is seen as an ongoing moral duty rather than a miraculous gift. The act of giving plays a crucial role in supporting the Church's ministry and aiding those in need, mirroring the love and generosity that God calls His people to embody. Leadership is another gift Paul mentions, which Storms interprets as involving diligent oversight and administration. He notes that leadership is not limited to elders and pastors, but can be exercised by various members within the Church. Cessationists affirm the gravity of leadership in maintaining order and guiding the Church. However, they distinguish between the apostolic authority present in the early church and contemporary leadership roles. Today's leaders are called to shepherd the flock and teach the word, ensuring that the church remains faithful to its biblical bases. Further, the gift of mercy, as discussed by Storms, involves showing compassion and aid to the sick, dispirited, and economically struggling, exercised with cheerfulness. Cessationists agree that acts of mercy are momentous expressions of Christian love and compassion. They view this gift as a continuing essentiality in the Church, reflecting the heart of Christ in caring for those in need. However, they distinguish between such acts of mercy and the miraculous gifts that they believe have ceased. To sum up, while Storms points out the ongoing magnitude and exercise of the spiritual gifts listed in Romans 12, 3, 8, a reformed cessationist perspective brings a subtle perception. 
Cessationists dispute that certain crucial and miraculous gifts, such as prophecy, have ceased with the accomplishment of the New Testament canon. They affirm the continuation of other gifts, such as teaching, service, exhortation, giving, leadership, and mercy, which remain indispensable for the edification and functioning of the Church. This perspective reiterates the sufficiency of Scripture and the influence of the Holy Spirit's ongoing work through the ordinary means of grace, ensuring that believers are equipped for every good work and the Church is built up in faith and unity. Besides, in Ephesians 4.11, 16, Paul outlines various roles within the Christian community, repeating their prestige for the Church's development and maturity. Storms underlines the priority of apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers, viewing these roles as gifts given by God to equip the saints for ministry and build up the body of Christ. Each role is imperative for backing unity, maturity and theological stability within the Church. However, from a reformed cessationist perspective, a different realization appears, especially regarding the continuation of certain roles, such as apostles and prophets. Storms argues that apostles and prophets were elemental to the early church, tasked with inaugurating the church and contributing essential revelation. He suggests that these roles continue in some form today, albeit in a modified capacity. Apostles, in Storms' view, may not hold the same authoritative position as the original apostles, but can still play an indispensable role in pioneering new ministries and church planting. Similarly, prophets, according to Storms, continue to receive and communicate divine revelations that edify and guide the church. In disparity, Reformed cessationism underscores that the roles of apostles and prophets were unique to the indispensable period of the early church and have ceased with the closing of the New Testament canon. Ephesians 2.20 describes the church as being built on the groundwork of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. This integral role hints that once the infrastructure was laid, these roles were no longer mandatory. Cessationists contend that the apostles were uniquely commissioned by Christ, witnessed his resurrection, and were endowed with extraordinary authority to install the church and write scripture. With the finishing of the canon, the revelatory function of apostles and prophets became redundant as the scriptures equip the exhaustive and sufficient revelation of God's will. The role of evangelists, mentioned in Ephesians 4.11, is viewed differently by cessationists. While Storm sees evangelists as those specifically gifted to proclaim the gospel and bring people to faith, cessationists agree that this role continues today. Evangelists are needed for the ongoing mission of the church, tasked with spreading the gospel message and leading people to Christ. This role is not tied to the integral period of the church, but is an ongoing requirement for the church's mission and progress. Additionally, shepherds and teachers, or pastor teachers, are pivotal roles within the Christian community, as emphasized by Paul. Storms accentuates the combined function of shepherding and teaching, suggesting that all pastors must also be teachers. This combined role is seen as decisive for nurturing and instructing the church. Reformed cessationists affirm the continuation of shepherds and teachers, viewing them as essential for the church's health and maturity. Shepherds are responsible for caring for the flock, furnishing spiritual oversight, and guiding the congregation in their walk with Christ. Teachers are tasked with faithfully expounding the scriptures, ensuring that the church is grounded in sound doctrine. Cessationists stress the pertinence of these roles being implanted in the achieved scripture. The shepherd teacher's primary duty is to teach and apply the Word of God, ensuring that the congregation grows in their recognition and application of biblical truths. This focus on the sufficiency of Scripture is central to the cessationist perspective, as it affirms the belief that all needed guidance and revelation are found within the Bible. Paul's attention in Ephesians 4.12, 16 on equipping the saints for ministry, asserts the collaborative nature of these roles. Storms and cessationists alike recognize that the ambition of these roles is to prepare believers for works of service, championing unity and maturity in the faith. The ultimate goal is for the church to attain the fullness of Christ, distinguished by doctrinal stability and spiritual maturity. Paul warns against being tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, highlighting the need for solid teaching and shepherding to protect the church from false teachings and instability. Cessationists debate 
that the sufficiency of scripture and the proper exercise of shepherding and teaching roles are crucial for achieving this stability. They dispute that the cessation of revelatory gifts does not leave the church lacking, but rather indicates the full and authoritative nature of the Bible. Shepherds and teachers are called to faithfully teach and apply scripture, equipping the saints and building up the body of Christ in love. In essence, while Storms maintains the ongoing applicability of all the roles mentioned in Ephesians 4.11, 16, Reformed cessationism affords a perspective that recognizes the intrinsic roles of apostles and prophets as unique to the early church. Cessationists affirm the continuation of evangelists, shepherds and teachers, pointing out their seriousness in proclaiming the gospel, giving spiritual oversight and teaching the word of God. This perspective reiterates the sufficiency of scripture and the need for faithful shepherding and teaching to equip the saints, cherish unity and ensure doctrinal stability within the church. The cessationist view supplies a groundwork for learning these roles within the context of a concluded canon and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit through the ordinary means of grace. Also, the theological connotations of cessationism are profound and quite shape the understanding and practice of the Christian faith within Reformed theology. At its core, cessationism holds that the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, such as prophecy, tongues and healing, ceased with the end of the apostolic age and the finalization of the New Testament canon. This belief is entrenched in the conviction that these gifts were primarily given to authenticate the Apostles' message and to lay the foundation of the early church. With the base instituted and the canon closed, cessationists argue that these extraordinary gifts are no longer paramount. One of the central theological indications of cessationism is the sufficiency of Scripture. Cessationists repeat that the Bible is the thorough and final revelation of God's will for humanity. Since the canon of Scripture is closed, there is no need for new revelations or prophetic messages. This perspective upholds the Bible's authority and sufficiency in all matters of faith and practice. Believers are heartened to rely solely on the Scriptures for guidance, teaching and edification, trusting that everything required for life and godliness is contained within its pages. This high view of Scripture reinforces the value of diligent study, expository preaching and sound doctrine in the life of the Church. Moreover, cessationism underlines the unique and major role of the apostles and prophets in the early Church. According to Ephesians 2.20, the Church is built on the base of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. Cessationists believe that once this bedrock was laid, the roles of apostles and prophets ceased. The apostles, who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection and personally commissioned by Christ, had a unique authority that is not passed down to subsequent generations. This comprehension guards against the elevation of contemporary leaders to apostolic status, preserving the distinctiveness of the original apostles' ministry and authority. The cessation of miraculous gifts does not signify that the Holy Spirit is no longer active in the Church. On the contrary, cessationists affirm that the Spirit continues to work powerfully in the lives of believers. However, the focus is on the ordinary means of grace rather than extraordinary manifestations. The Spirit's work is seen in the conviction of sin, regeneration of hearts, sanctification of believers, and the enablement for ministry. The Spirit illuminates the Scriptures, enabling believers to perceive and apply God's Word. This ongoing work of the Spirit is important for the spiritual advance and maturity of the Church, even in the absence of miraculous gifts. Furthermore, Cessationism has practical meanings for the life and practice of the Church. It inspires a focus on the expository preaching of the Word, underscoring the need for pastors and teachers to faithfully proclaim and explain the Scriptures. This way ensures that the congregation is fixed and grounded in biblical truth, protecting against false teachings and doctrinal errors. In addition, cessationism places a strong insistence on the importance of theological education and the training of church leaders to handle the Word of God accurately and effectively. Further, cessationism cultivates a reliance on prayer and the ordinary means of grace. Believers are spurred to seek God's guidance and provision through prayer, trusting in His sovereignty and faithfulness. The sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are viewed as fundamental means through which God imparts grace and strengthens the faith of His people. These practices are seen as sufficient for nurturing spiritual advancement and sustaining the life of the Church. 
Another theological overtone of cessationism is the grasp of the nature and aspiration of spiritual gifts. Cessationists believe that the non-miraculous gifts, such as teaching, exhortation, leadership and mercy, continue to be imperative for the edification of the Church. These gifts are given by the Spirit to build up the body of Christ and to enable believers to serve one another in love. This perspective emphasizes the communal and edifying nature of spiritual gifts, encouraging believers to use their gifts for the benefit of the whole Church. Besides, cessationism aids as a safeguard against the potential abuses and excesses associated with the pursuit of miraculous gifts. By accentuating the sufficiency of Scripture and the achieved revelation, it provides a stable and objective groundwork for faith and practice. This perspective protects against the dangers of subjective experiences and personal revelations that may lead to doctrinal confusion and division within the Church. In summation, the theological ramifications of cessationism are far-reaching, impacting the insight of Scripture, the role of the Holy Spirit, and the practice of the Church. Cessationism upholds the sufficiency and authority of the Bible, affirming the significance of expository preaching, theological education, and the ordinary means of grace. It maintains the unique and significant role of the apostles and prophets while affirming the ongoing work of the Spirit in the life of the Church. By focusing on the communal and edifying nature of spiritual gifts, cessationism stimulates believers to serve one another in love and to rely on the Scriptures for guidance and growth. This perspective brings a robust plan for realizing and living out the Christian faith within the context of a realized canon and the abiding work of the Holy Spirit. Last but not least, the practical applications of cessationism for the Church are manifold, deeply influencing the path to ministry, worship, and community life. Central to cessationist practice is the conviction that the Bible is the complete and sufficient revelation of God's will, which shapes every aspect of Church life. This belief asserts the urgency of expository preaching, where the focus is on faithfully expounding the Scriptures. Pastors and teachers are tasked with the diligent study of the Bible to accurately convey its truths to the congregation. This approach ensures that the Church is anchored and grounded in sound doctrine, which is pressing for spiritual development and maturity. By highlighting the centrality of Scripture, cessationism boosts a Church culture that values theological depth and biblical literacy. In addition to preaching, cessationism places a strong priority on the ordinary means of grace, such as prayer, sacraments, and the fellowship of believers. These practices are seen as the primary ways through which God imparts grace and strengthens the faith of His people. Prayer is notably important, as it echoes a dependence on God's sovereignty and a recognition of His strength to work in and through His people. Corporate and individual prayer are emboldened as paramount to the Christian life seeking God's guidance, supplies, and intervention. The sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are viewed not slightly as symbolic acts, but as decisive means of grace that nurture and sustain believers' faith. Regular participation in these sacraments reinforces the believer's connection to Christ and the community of faith. Also, the cessationist perspective influences the knowledge and exercise of spiritual gifts within the Church. While cessationists believe that miraculous gifts, such as prophecy and tongues, have ceased, they affirm the continuation of non-miraculous gifts, like teaching, exhortation, leadership, and mercy. These gifts are indispensable for the edification and functioning of the Church. Teaching, for instance, remains an integral gift for instructing believers in sound doctrine and practical living. Cessationist churches typically invest in the development of teachers who are capable of effectively communicating biblical truths. This focus on teaching helps ensure that the congregation is equipped to differentiate truth from error and to grow in their perception of God's Word. Exhortation, another integral gift, involves heartening and motivating believers to live out their faith in practical ways. This gift is urgent for feeding a vibrant and active church community where members are spurred on to love and good works. Leaders in cessationist churches are often encouraged to advance the gift of exhortation to stimulate and confront the congregation to greater faith and service. The gift of leadership is also indicated, principally in terms of shepherding and contributing spiritual oversight. Cessationist leaders are tasked with guiding the church in a manner that is consistent with biblical principles. 
ensuring that all activities and decisions align with Scripture. Moreover, the gift of mercy, which involves showing compassion and equipping practical assistance to those in need, is highly valued. Cessationist churches often build ministries focused on caring for the sick, the poor, and the marginalized, reflecting the love and compassion of Christ. These ministries are seen as integral to the church's mission, furnishing tangible expressions of the gospel to the community. By spurring the exercise of these non-miraculous gifts, cessationism foments a church environment where every member can contribute to the health and vitality of the body of Christ. Another practical application of cessationism is the significance of theological education and the training of church leaders. Cessationist churches often prioritize the progress of strong educational programs to equip pastors, teachers, and other leaders with the knowledge and skills vital for effective ministry. This engagement to education ensures that leaders are well prepared to handle the scriptures accurately and to shepherd the congregation faithfully. By investing in theological education, cessationist churches aim to cultivate a leadership that is acutely rooted in biblical truth and capable of guiding the church with wisdom and integrity. Furthermore, cessationism impacts the church's access to worship. With a stress on the sufficiency of scripture, worship services in cessationist churches are typically centered around the reading and preaching of the word. Music and other elements of worship are carefully chosen to align with biblical themes and to support the overall message of the service. This way seeks to ensure that worship remains God-centered and edifying for the congregation. By focusing on scripture and sound doctrine, cessationist worship aims to forward a profound and authentic involvement with God. In addition, cessationism stimulates a booming communal life within the church. The fellowship of believers is seen as a key means of grace, where mutual encouragement, accountability, and support are furthered. Small groups, Bible studies, and other forms of communal gatherings are promoted to help believers grow in their faith and build strong, supportive relationships. This weight on community helps to create a sense of belonging and unity within the church reflecting the biblical ideal of the body of Christ functioning together in harmony. In brief, the practical applications of cessationism for the church are extensive, shaping the path to ministry, worship and community life. By underlining the sufficiency of scripture, expository preaching, the ordinary means of grace, and the exercise of non-miraculous gifts, cessationism harbors a church environment that is intensely implanted in biblical truth and assured to the progress and edification of its members. This perspective gives a hearty scheme for understanding and living out the Christian faith, ensuring that the church remains faithful to its mission and calling in a manner that honors God and builds up the body of Christ. In conclusion, the Reformed cessationist perspective displays a hefty structure for distinguishing the role of spiritual gifts, the authority of Scripture, and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the church today. By underscoring the sufficiency of the Bible as the total and final revelation of God's will, Cessationism upholds the desideratum of diligent expository preaching and theological education, ensuring that believers are grounded in sound doctrine. This perspective recognizes the unique and principal roles of apostles and prophets in the early church, emphasizing that their functions ceased with the completion of the New Testament canon. However, it affirms the continuation of non-miraculous gifts such as teaching, exhortation, leadership and mercy which remain crucial for the edification and functioning of the church. Further, the practical applications of cessationism nurture a church environment centered on the ordinary means of grace, including prayer, sacraments, and the fellowship of believers. This approach nurtures a rich reliance on God's sovereignty and cultivates a community of faith pledged to mutual support and accountability. By focusing on the accomplished Word of God, cessationist churches aim to protect against doctrinal errors and subjective experiences that can lead to confusion and division. Instead, they promote a stable and objective bedrock for faith and practice, entrenched in the unchanging truths of Scripture. All in all, cessationism supplies a balanced and theologically sound access to Christian life and ministry, accentuating the surviving relevance and authority of the Bible. The meaningful role of spiritual gifts in building up the church and the ongoing transformative work of the Holy Spirit. This perspective ensures that the Church remains faithful to its mission, equipped for every good work, and unified in its obligation to glorifying God and advancing His kingdom.